very warm good evening to everyone who's joined us with the, in the session today on behalf of the tis asim premji school of education i would like to welcome you all to our weekly webinar series conversations the discussion forum of the school uh, we have with us today professor abhijit patak and it's a great pleasure for me to introduce him today and professor patak has taught uh, at the center for the study of social systems at the jawaharlal nehru university for over 31 years from march 1990 to december 2021 uh, he has authored many books like modernity globalization identity towards a reflexive quest uh, indian modernity contradictions paradoxes and possibilities 10 lectures on education and many other books and he is also a regular columnist at the indian express the wire the tribune and he has written extensively on education culture and social theory uh we are def definitely looking forward to uh, hear from you today sir and before we begin uh, a small request to the participants uh, kindly stay on mute uh, when sir is talking so that we can avoid interruptions during the sessions going on and going by the regular format we follow uh, uh, we'll open the forum for discussion uh, after sir finishes his talk so over to sir okay should i begin yes Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, uh, and thank you, Anu, for giving me an opportunity to come here to share my ideas with you, and most importantly, to learn from your minds. And I have always believed that teaching is the finest form of studentship, and you continually learn, and every moment is a moment of learning. So. Uh, Uh, really grateful to you that uh, I got an opportunity to meet you and to share some of my ideas. Uh, can you hear me, all of you? Is there any yes. problem? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, you know that what I'm going to do and what I'm going to speak. Uh, this is not something uh, very uh, bookish or technical. Uh, instead it is more in the spirit of a conversation and uh, uh, so that at the end of the day some ideas come Uh, emerges i think uh, his uh, his connection is uh, lost there are some disturbances no yes actually you were lost for to uh, one minute okay 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 so what i'm <clears throat> sorry what i'm going to say uh it emerges out of uh, deep experience and this experience of engaging with young students uh, for more than 31 years at jnu and every morning when you come to the classroom engage with ideas and invite students to the domain of ideas theories methods substantial issues philosophies every day looks like a new beginning and there is a huge amount of freshness and innovation every morning and i tend to believe that if it sustains you if it gives you a meaning and if even after 31 years you cease to be a pessimist that is precisely because there is something positive and vibrant about our classroom experiences we could transform our classrooms we could make it a reasonably dialogic space we could generate positive vibrations and the critical vibrations in the classroom so it is this hope it is this experience that has sustained me and that has inspired me to join you this afternoon so this is the background this is the context now i think that you know that 
when we teach that, and particularly in the context of the university. Now, I always believe that there is one danger that has to be overcome in the university life. And that danger is certain kind of a false duality or dichotomy of research versus teaching. I think that the university life ought to be seen more as an integrated life where your teaching reinforces your research and your research reinforces your teaching. And these two are organically deeply related. And as a result, the books you publish, the papers you write. Likewise, when you come to the classroom, you engage with students, you evaluate the performance, evaluate the writings of students, you talk to them, you engage with them. These activities are as important and as significant as the act of writing our own professional papers and doing research. There is an ori, you know, that haunts me at times that in many centers and the universities, we seem to have lost that organic connection between teaching and research. And if we lose that connection, then what happens that the act of dissemination of ideas, the vibrancy of the classroom that suffers and if our classrooms are not dialogic, if our classrooms are not allied, if our classrooms are not illuminating and vibrant, then there is a great danger to democracy. Because democracy is about conversations. Democracy is about dialogue. Democracy is about listening. And that's why I'm a strong believer that our classrooms have to be dialogic. Our classrooms have to be sufficiently sensitive. And teachers and students have to constantly engage in meaningful, critical conversation. And that is the reason why I say that we have to fight a false dichotomy and the duality research versus teaching. Both reinforce each other. So having said that, then the another point that just strange to say that as teachers, when we come to the classroom, we teach not just specialized courses. We are not just tip recorders, repeating the academic scriptures, scriptures written by Michel Foucault or Judith Butler or Emil Durkheim or Max Weber. We are something more. We are not just completing the syllabus taking the exams, conducting the exams, and hierarchizing and grading the students and supplying the data to the higher authorities. There is a higher role of being a teacher. And that higher role, as teachers, we ought to have faith in that role. That role is that we are not just tape recorders. We do not just complete the syllabus, conduct the exam, and grade the students. We are communicators. We are heroes. We are co travelers. We are wanderers. So, with students as teachers, teachers and students as co travelers, continually walking, raising new questions, exploring the world, learning unlearning and evolving together. And I think it is something which is very important for all of us to realize if we wish to keep the vocation alive and if we wish to keep our classrooms vibrant, democratic, sensitive, and dialogic. So that is the reason why I chose that when Anu contacted me, I chose that let me share with young students some of this idea of the vibrant classroom and essentially on dialogue, listening, and critical pedagogy. And I'm deeply aware of the fact, like all of you, I'm talking about or I'm acquiring the courage to talk about dialogue and listening and criticality at a time when we are seeing 
the absence of dialogue in the larger society. When we are seeing, witnessing, not only in India, but in a large part of the world, the cult of narcissism, the rising authoritarianism, the cult of militant nationalism, and the neoliberal gospel of unlimited greed and consumerism. Under these circumstances, when we see the democratization, the spirit of dialogue and conversation is eroding. It is more important on the part of teachers and sensitive young minds like you to think of dialogue, to do something about it, and at least the space in which you and I operate, our colleges, our campuses, our universities, our classroom, in that space to create the sphere of communication and the sphere of dialogue. And that too at a time when the possibility of dialogue and communication is disappearing otherwise because of, as I have said, the rising narcissism, authoritarianism, militancy, and neoliberal global capitalism. So I'm aware of that challenge. The fact that we confront the challenge, that is precisely the reason why I ought to take the question of dialogue and listening and hybrid classroom much more deeply and much more seriously. So having said that in my, this brief introduction, now let me just begin. And when I say at the beginning that it's a 31 years of teaching and learning and engaging with young students and the generations of students, you know, the experiences I have gathered, something of that kind I want to share with you. But when I say that it is my experience, then I'm possibly wrong because there is no such thing as a discrete atomized individual called me. I'm connected and it is important to have a sense of that connectedness. And this is what I would argue that when I speak of my experience, then I'm also aware that this is my experience. It's not just my experience. Possibly it is the experience of many of, many teachers across the universe, across the universities, colleges, throughout the world. And particularly I would recall the spirit of some of the thinkers, philosophers, and the educationists that constantly whispers into my ears, that envelops me from all sides, and that possibly shapes my thinking, my way of seeing, and even the discourse that I would deliver at this meeting today. Briefly, I would speak of four or five names before I begin. One is, of course, Critical pedagogues like Bell Hooks and Paul of Fair. You know, Bell Hooks and Paul of Fair. Imagine Bell Hooks died and let us invoke her spirit. A great feminist who constantly interrogated and questioned patriarchy and racism in the white dominated classroom. And not only that, a feminist who questioned patriarchy and racism constantly engaged with Buddhist thinker, philosopher, sage like Thich Nhat Hanh, and like engaged religiosity, thought about engaged pedagogy and brought experiences in the classrooms. And her classrooms became vibrant and alive. And her mode of teaching and the classroom experiences was more like an experience of healing. So on the one hand, people like Bell Hooks, all fears, critique of monologue, sprint of dialogue, and the pedagogy of hope. And likewise, Henry Giro in our time, who is constantly questioning neoliberal assault on higher education and the growing corporatization and the marketization of learning and education and the commodification of education and reducing education into mere technical skill learning and his battle to recover the critical humanistic spirit in the realm of education, which today is getting eroded 
because of the neoliberal assault on the domain of education. So here, Bell Hooks, uh, Henry Giro, these were the thinkers, the spirit that also, you know, I'm indebted to them. I'm indebted to them. I constantly communicate with them, converse with them, engage with them. Oh, by some disturbances coming in. Anyway, so uh, is it okay? Actually, uh, Professor Abhijit, uh, um, the, uh, there is a message I got. The voice quality is a little. If if okay, is it okay to keep the um, uh, this thing uh, near to you? Uh, which one? This Should I switch up the fan? No, not it is not this uh, uh, fan. Uh, rather, the audio. If uh, uh, the audio quality is slightly. Okay, okay, let me see. Is it okay? Can you hear me now? Clearly? Yeah, now it is better. The, yeah, the microphone. And if you want, to... I could switch up the fan also. Let me try it once. Now, is it okay? Yeah. Yeah, it's better now. It is better now. Let, let me let me try my best. Yeah. Uh, uh, in case there is any problem, please remind me. Yes. Okay. So I was talking about this great educationist, you know, um, like Henry Giraud and uh, <clears throat> Ben Hooks and uh, Paulo Freire, and. Uh, so the point that I'm trying to argue is that when I say that it's my experience, and this is essentially not the experience of a discrete, insulated individual. As a learner, you constantly grow, evolve, communicate with great ideas, with great thinkers, and all that shape you, you know, um, and keep your um, keep your spirit alive. So, likewise with this critical pedagogues. I also feel that, as I've just mentioned the name of the Buddhist monk, and again, let, let me invoke him, Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, who experienced the brutality of Vietnam War and his engagement with Buddhism, with Jain tradition, and his engaged Buddhism, and the way he spoke of, engaged with Martin Luther King Jr. and spoke of peace and constantly championed the spirit of compassionate listening laughing he thinks, compassionate listening, and a new form of learning and engagement, and the notion of the interbeing that Thich Nhat Hanh spoke of and talked about. We lost him recently. So just, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh, and then of course, great educationist that our country saw, people like Jiddu Krishnamurti, truth is a pathless land, and his constant emphasis on the spirit of being a wanderer, and Rabindranath Tagore. So all these, you know, from Paulo Freire to Krishnamurti to Tagore to Bell Hooks to Thich Nhat Hanh. So you converse with many, and then you engage with young minds, see the world, and constantly as co-travelers, you walk, you learn, unlearn. So this is the spirit of the conversation and the dialogue and the listening I'm talking about. And as I have said, that how important it is to keep our classrooms vibrant, alive, and dialogic. So this is where, with this background, let me briefly talk about these three components, which I said the centrality of our presentation today. Dialogue, compassionate listening, and critical pedagogy. Now, when you speak of dialogue, you know, that Dialogue does not mean when you and I are engaged in a dialogue, it does not mean that you and I necessarily arrive at a consensus. You and I necessarily agree with everything. But what dialogue means is the acknowledgement of the presence of the other. What Martin Buber would argue, teaching in that sense is an act of communion. It's not a relationship 
between the I-it relationship. Instead, it is the I-thou relationship. Teacher and the student talking to each other, listening to one another. It does not necessarily mean that student agrees with everything that the teacher says, or the teacher agrees with everything that the student says. But what is important is that they acknowledge the presence of one another with great humility, with great seriousness, with great sincerity. One is not engaged in silencing the other, in reducing the other into a reified object. Instead, the otherness is overcome and with empathy, a dialogue, a communication begins to take place. It is in that sense, the Bubar would argue, it's communion, it's a conversation, it's a dialogue. And Paulo Freire, in his own way, reminded us so deeply that our classrooms quite often become a celebration of silence, silence of the learners, silence of the student, the all-powerful teacher's monologue, his or her scholarship, the burden of knowledge that silences young minds and silences students. And this silence has to be overcome. And only when this silence is overcome, when you and I gain our voice, regain our language, our criticality. And as just I said at the beginning, the teacher and the student as co-travelers, as comrades, listening to one another, talking to each other, walking together, problematizing the world together, and through that problem-posing education, constantly evolving, growing, sharpening their understanding of the world. So it is this dialogue. And as I have said, that this dialogue is so important. And this dialogue is so important. And unless we become sufficiently dialogic, we cannot retain and restore the spirit of democracy. Because democracy is not just the ritualization of periodic elections. Democracy is not just the act of choosing the lesser evil. Democracy as a way of life, democracy as a way of thinking, way of acting, a way of communication. And that way of thinking, acting, and communication requires an intense dialogic spirit. And that's why I insist our classrooms have to be sufficiently dialogic. And these dialogic classrooms, no matter what you and I are teaching, whether it is algebra or grammar, whether it is a Marxism or feminism, you know, the classroom, that the mode of teaching and learning ought to have that element of communication and that element of dialogue. And then the second thing is the listening. That again, dialogue is impossible without listening. Listening is not just the pretension of listening. Listening is not just for argumentation. It's not what we see on the panel discussions on television channels. That whatever happens, that the television channel would invite a Congress spokesperson, a BJP spokesperson, a left spokesperson, you know, and there are no listening takes place. Because no matter what one is speaking, what the BJP is speaking, Congress would refute, and what Congress is speaking, BJP would refute. You know, it's a pretense of listening. It is just the art to defeat others, to contest others. But compassionate listening doesn't emerge out of that split of sadomasochism. Compassionate listening is a genuine will to understand, to listen to others, and to realize that listening is important because it is quite possible that my horizon might be restricted. And when I listen to others, my horizon can be expanded. So listening leads to the possibility of expansion of horizons. And compassionate listening is so important. And I insist on that and my genuine experience and all of you in your own centers of learning must have passed through the same experience that how this listening is important in the classroom. And what obstruct that listening? 
you know, what obstruct the listening is the burden of certainty, burden of epistemological and political certainty. When I'm too certain of my position, then my thinking becomes totally dead. I close the windows of my consciousness. I refuse to listen to others. So I have often said, I have often, yes? Is it okay? It's okay, there was some other disturbance. Please. Okay, so I have often seen, I'll just give an illustration, what I call the burden of certainty. I've seen that a professor, and I talk about both the problem from both sides. A professor who is a Marxist, but then quite then I've seen that a Marxist professor with the burden of certainty, with the reductionism of Marxism, refuses to come to terms with the ideas, you know, that question Marxism, that interrogate Marxism. Instead, for example, the art to silence the other opinions, the silence the other perspectives. And that I think is something very worrying. Likewise, in the classroom, I would see that an Ambedkarite student or a Gandhian student would seldom talk to each other. It would be taken for granted that there is no way that a Gandhian and an Ambedkarite can converse with each other. But I would argue that a dialogic classroom is not a party school. A dialogic classroom is not a space for writing political pamphlets. A dialogic classroom is a space where one begins to listen to other. So it's like saying that I would imagine a dialogic classroom in which a Marxist professor listens carefully with great intelligence a student writing a term paper on Karl Popper's open society and its enemies and evolving, taking insights from Karl Popper, evolving a sharp critique of Marxism. And the professor at the end of the day congratulates the student by saying that dear student, I might not have agreed with every critique that Karl Popper evolved about Marxism, but I understand and I appreciate your sincere engagement with Karl Popper. This evening, your thumb paper has inspired me to read Karl Popper once again. That is what a living classroom, what the art of listening, what a dialogic classroom would do, in which the Marxist, Ambedkarites, Gandhians, eco-feminist, development activities, all would confess, talk to one another, listen to one another, learn and unlearn from one another. And that's a great challenge. But I think it's a challenge that as teachers and students, you and I ought to undertake. And that compassionate listening, as I would argue, is also important for generating what I would argue an environment of non-violent mode of conflict resolution. We live in a terribly violent world. And in that violent world, and in that world characterized by cult of authoritarianism, narcissism, militancy, we need dialogue and compassionate listening also as a kind of non-violent mode of conflict resolution. And then with the dialogue and the listening, and then the third, is the criticality about critical pedagogy. All of you who have read, you know, people like Paulo Freire, people like Bell Hooks, people like Henry Giro and others, and bright students of education, are, and that too in a place like Tata Institute of Social Sciences, are students of critical pedagogy, are deeply aware of critical pedagogy. So I need not elaborate it much more, but just take this thing, you know, I just uh, ask myself and want you to think about it. Does critical pedagogy mean falling into the trap of cynicism and despair? When you see the discourse of power, when you interrogate the discourse of power, when you see what Marx wanted you to see, 
that how capitalism transformed every relationship into a relationship between two objects and the commodities. The way in Capital Volume 1, Marx would characterize it as commodity fetishism, the relations between two human beings no longer look like relationships between two creative souls and subjects. It looks like a relationship between two objects, commodities, things. All the heavenly actresses have been drowned into icy water of egoistic calculation, as Marx would have said. So Marx is opening our critical eyes to see that what capitalism does to us, you know. Likewise, for example, when Gandhi wrote the Hind Sharaj in the form of a conversation between the editor and the reader, Gandhi was with a high degree of criticality was opening our eyes and making us see the brute force implicit in colonial modernity and how decolonization is impossible without interrogating that brute force and creating a new language of resistance through what Gandhi would have characterized as soul force as opposed to the brute force. So Marx, Gandhi, or Ambedkar writing Annihilation of Caste, opening our eyes, giving us certain kind of critical insights and making us see that how, for example, exclusionary practices of an oppressive caste ideology is implicit in patriarchal Brahminism. You know, so Marx, Kanti, Ambedkar in their own ways, you know, are opening the eyes, question enabling us, inspiring us, giving us certain kind of a pedagogic tool to question power, to see beyond the dominant ideology of power and to raise critical questions and to look at the world much more deeply, meaningfully critical. So, and fear talks about how the pedagogy of the oppressed would create a new dialogic world, a world of collective redemption, a collective freedom, you know, the problem posing education. Now, these, and as I've said, the way Bill Hooks would constantly interrogate racism and patriarchy in our classrooms, or Henry Giro in our times, again and again reminding us of the neoliberal attack on higher education or on culture of learning, the massive corporatization and the commodification of education. So the spirit of critical pedagogy, we need to bring out in our classrooms again and again. But the question I have said, is critical pedagogy taking you to the domain of cynicism? Why I ask this question? There are many bright students who often say, that sir, the more I study sociology, or the critical social sciences, I feel that there is no hope. I see the critic of everything. I see the critic of capitalism. I see critic of popular cinema. I see critic of culture industry. I see critic of television show operas. So I find no hope anywhere. I, is it that the more I study social sciences with the spirit of critical pedagogy, Am I falling into the trap of despair and cynicism? And this is the point of caution. Criticality is not cynicism. Criticality is not mindless deconstruction. Criticality is also a quest for a new possibility. And that quest for a new possibility, Marx strove for a new possibility. His critique of capitalism led to a new possibility a new dream of communism. Gandhi's critique of colonialism led to a new possibility of soul force as a mode of resistance and decolonization. And likewise, you know, Paulo Freire's critique of monologic education led to a new possibility of dialogic humanistic education. So criticality is not just a no. Criticality is also a quest, a search for another yes. Yes to a better world, a human world. Yes to justice, yes to equity, yes to plurality, yes to humanity, democratization. And this is where I believe that, you know, that the emancipatory role, the liberating potential of critical pedagogy lies. 
And when you see the connection of the three, dialogue, compassionate listening, and critical pedagogy, then we begin to redefine our classroom practices, redefine ourselves as students and teachers. And we redefine ourselves as students and teachers. And as we have said, then possibly we begin to realize that as students, we are not just exam warriors. Our task is not just to write exam and get the degrees. And as teachers, we are not just the mediators between the students and the official curriculum. We are not just data providers and data suppliers to the higher authorities. We are communicators, we are healers, we are dialogic, reflexive, critical pedagogues. And teachers and students as travelers constantly wandering, walking together. And then we redefine ourselves. And I believe this redefinition is absolutely important at a time when neoliberalism and militant nationalism and the psychology of aggression and the war right now that we are witnessing today. And when you look at the war, and let me end with that, when you see the war, and this war that we are seeing, now the, imagine a question that Zygmunt Bauman raised in Modernity and Holocaust. And the question that Zygmunt Bauman raised, that is Holocaust an aberration in an otherwise good modern civilization? Or is Holocaust implicit in the age of modernity with its technical instrumental rationality? You know, now is it that, you know, that history is the history of wars? But let us ask a question why the age of modernity, despite its gospel of freedom, reason, technological abundance, has not succeeded in overcoming the war. And war has become more and more devastating, technologically sleek. And when television commentators on our television channels, day and night are giving a right commentary on the war and the Russian invasion on Ukraine, it looks like a cricket commentary or 100 meter Olympic race commentary with the similar excitement. Is it like a video war? You know, the question that Bodrila asked once again, did the Gulf War actually happen? You know, or was it more like a video game that you and I consumed in front of the television camera? Amid this psychic impoverishment, amid this brutalization of consciousness, it is important to see the danger of hyper-nationalism, the danger of militarism, and the greed of techno-capitalism and totalitarian socialism, you know, and how this has led to the devastating war from Vietnam to Afghanistan to Gulf War, and now the war that we are watching. So what does it mean to talk about education, dialogue, compassionate listening, and critical pedagogy in the time of war? And I believe many young students every day are asking these questions. When I come to the classroom, there is war, there is violence, you know, what do I do? Do I only write the exam and just write yet another term paper on Pierre Bourdieu or talked persons and get a good grade? Or is there something more that you and I ought to think about, talk about, discuss in our classrooms? as part of the dialogic beings. And as the world we are seeing, and this is where I will just end with all these people with which I began, you know, Paul Freire, Bell Hooks, Eric from, you know, Thichnathan, um, Gandhi, now all of them, you know, would be, for example, could give us certain kind of ethical, political, moral, pedagogic foundations for peace, for working with the pacifist movement all over the world, you know. And that is possible only when we cultivate some of the faculties, the dialogue, loving kindness, compassionate listening, and a pedagogy of hope. 
and critical pedagogy would invariably take us to a pedagogy of hope. So with this quest, with this search, I would appeal to young minds and to young students, you know, that uh, we are living in difficult times, extremely difficult times, but under these difficult circumstances, you and I as students have to constantly talk to one another, give hope to one another, and try to strive for a new culture of learning and education. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, I think we, we are now open to taking questions. So you can, the participants can either uh, unmute and ask their questions, or you can also put down your questions in the chat box. Uh, participants. Uh, Saumya Mantri, you can go ahead with the question. Good evening, sir. Uh, I had one question uh, related to uh, I had one question related to American classrooms. Uh, so I recently heard that in uh, American classrooms, uh, they have been asking kids to uh, write the positive positives of imperialism and the negative of imperialisms at the same time. Uh, what do you think about that? Could you elaborate it? Just what you were uh, what you were saying. And what happened in the American classroom? So in an, in an assignment, a student was supposed to write the, uh, the bad effects of imperialism as well as the positives of something like imperialism. Uh, do you think there could be any positives of imperialism and should students be asked to write something like that as an assignment? I think to a large extent, it would depend on the teacher as a catalyst. Now, suppose a teacher has asked two students, one to write in favor of, you know, imperialism or colonialism and another against that. And, uh, but if the teacher is not like a typical debate contest judge, you know, for or against. But if the teacher is essentially interested that ultimately let in that classroom a conversation begin to take place and the teacher as a catalyst, who knows at the end of the day, the student who wrote in favor of imperialism might at the end of the day begin to open his consciousness, windows of his consciousness, and change, amend, alter his position. And that's why I think that it is very important in any act of dialogue and conversation to begin with not to demonize anybody, not to demonize someone who critiques me, who has a different perspective, different point of view. It is important that one begin to talk, one begin to listen. So it's like saying that only through that constant conversation, constant conversation, a possibility of certain kind of opening up of consciousness is possible, can come. You know, otherwise it is not just the imperialism. And that's why I'm giving the illustration. It is an extreme illustration. Now suppose, uh, 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 a professor asked a student uh, that a two student uh, to write 300 words on uh, the um, uh, um, uh, on the 
positive aspects of Gandhi's ideas and the negative aspects of Gandhi's ideas. And then an Ambedkarite student says, can there be any positive aspects of Gandhi at all? Gandhi is full of the negative ideas, is casteist, you know, and can there be any positive aspects of Gandhi at all? So you cannot give an assignment of that kind. Then the dialogue stops, but the task of the teacher is that, yes, young person, you have a very strong point of view and you might have the reason to have this point of view, but let's listen to your another friend who might have another perspective. Let's talk to one another, listen to one another. Let's see what others are engaging with that. And maybe at the end of the day, possibly the Ambedkarite student begin to borrows a book of Gandhi from the library and the Gandhian student borrows a book of Ambedkar from the library. You know, that is the possibility. That is the possibility we ought to strive for, to transform the classroom into a non-dialogic space with the burden of certainty with which the professor or a section of student come, that would be very um, non-democratic, non-dialogic classroom. So that is the way I would respond to it. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, Rajan Jimbo. Yeah. 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 One more thing uh, I just want to say, ke the class, uh, the lady before asking about, ke there may be that uh, the teacher want to uh, want to understand that what are the misconceptions that their students have. If she if she think that uh, this is uh, uh, this cannot have any negative thing, then there may there may be some misconceptions. For example, uh, just a simple one is, ke through imperialism. Uh, the smaller countries get access to technology, get access to, um, uh, 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 can feel more uh, security. So these guys uh, kind of uh, perceptions or conceptions, what their students carry. So maybe teacher can uh, uh, go for that, na? Ke bhai, uh, what are the things, so that she could take it, to, take it to the class and discuss about this. Thank you. Right, right. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Rajan. So I, I think we have Shiksha Rawal uh, who has also raised her hand. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for the session. Uh, from uh, what I've heard, I, I realize that the professor or the teacher plays a very important role in facilitating dialogue. Uh, but I'm also wondering how do we move towards a space where students can self-regulate and uh, create that dialogic space for themselves among themselves because we know that the professor is available only for a certain certain time of the day and uh, learning for students happens beyond the classroom and so I'm wondering what spaces we can create and how we can create uh, where students will be able to have those dialogues by themselves without an external facilitator. No, I think it's a lovely observation and the lovely questions. And that's why the expression that I'm saying uh, that teacher as a student and student as a teacher, and which Paulo Freire used it very beautifully, teacher hyphen student engaging with student hyphen teacher. And, uh, and that's why I'm saying that teacher and student, teacher is not some kind of supreme authority teacher and student as co-travelers. And when the teacher engages in the class, comes to the classroom with that spirit of dialogue and the co-traveler, then eventually students begin to take care of themselves. And not only that, I would just say that um, um, in my experience of teaching, I have often seen that students have made me humble and students have sharpened my ethos of dialogue further. I would just give an illustration. I was teaching a very problematic course called Modern Indian Social Thought at Jeno at the master's level. And that's a course where you engage with a spectrum of ideas and thinkers, right from Shami Vivekanand's practical Vedanta to Jyotirao Phule's Golamgiri to Shavitri Bai Phule, 
or right from Sri Aurobindo's, you know, the foundations of Indian culture to Dr. B. R. Ambedkar's, the philosophy of Hinduism, and from Gandhi to M. N. Roy, so from Marx, Marxist, Gandhians, Ambedkarites, uh, Vedantists, so a lot of these ideas are there. And you could imagine the intensity of debate, anger, dialogue take place in the classroom. Now, once in the process of engaging with ideas, in the classroom, I referred to Alama Iqbal's one poem, you know. And when I referred to Alama Iqbal's poem in the classroom, now there was a fight among students. Some students said that why I am referring to Alama Iqbal's poem in the class, why I am not referring to a Tamil poet. Another group of students are saying that why I am not referring to a Bengali poet, why I am referring to that all things of representation begin to come. And it was a very turbulent classroom. None is willing to listen to one another. And Alama Iqbal is almost forgotten at that moment. And the battle is on that, why not Tamil poet? Why not Bengali poet? Why Alama Iqbal? Now then one student from Madhya Pradesh, uh, thin, shy, non-assuming, stood up. And he said that why this noise? Just first listen to that poem, Alama Iqbal poem, deeply, intensely, without noise, and who knows, maybe listening to a good poet would inspire all of us to discover great poets from all over the country. So Alama Iqbal, apart from being a constraint, would create an environment of a new search, searching a Tamil poet, searching a Malayalam poet, searching a Bengali poet. And I was amazed after the class, I enjoyed my tea with him and I said, it's brilliant. What I could not do in the classroom, your intervention brought that spirit, that spirit of conversation and the dialogue. The window suddenly got opened. Our horizon got expanded. So I think that as co-travelers and as, and, and I would say that at times, your students are your great teachers, great teachers. Yes, sir. I love the term co-travelers. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I can see a question in the chat box. Uh, this is from Mithilesh Kumar. Um, in the era of factual-based knowledge or bookish information in the curriculum at the elementary level, which method used to enhance the critical thinking in learners? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I think it's a very, very good question. And um, uh, I believe that um, uh, all of us and um, um, teachers, students, and the T students who are going to become educators, we all ought to constantly think about and inquire into what is happening, you know. And uh, this uh, MCQ-centric, multiple choice type centric, MCQ-centric, so-called fact-oriented objective questions, you know, that it is very important uh, to see through it, to problematize it, and to bring the ethos of meaningful, critical, liberating learning. Now, it's like saying that uh, when uh, uh, um, you reduce everything, be it a piece of Pablo Neruda's poem or Gandhi's salt march or an algebraic equation into a typical puzzle with four options and only one option is the only correct answer. You know, and you have to tick the correct answer, one and only one correct answer. Are we reducing the domain of ideas and education into Amitabh Bachchan Kondmanega Krorpoti show? 
where there is one correct answer to the question. But when you explore the domain of ideas, then it is a domain of argumentation. It is a domain of thinking. It is a domain of reflection. And if we negate those faculties of argumentation, debate, creative articulation, critical thinking in the name of MCQ questions, then I think we would do a great damage to the spirit of education, to the spirit of learning. And that's why it is very, very important to think about it. And now the uh, common entrance test for 45 central universities is coming. And again, as I, the report that I have read so far, it's again like our national eligibility test. Again, it's like another MCQ kind of exam, you know, uh, uh, that is going to happen. And I believe that uh, a lot of educationists and the pedagogues are thinking seriously and many of them evolved a sharp critique from America to India, everywhere, critique of this kind of standardized tests uh, with the MCQ kind of a thing. So I think your question has a lot of significance and meaning. Thank you, Professor. Uh, there is a, a question from Bushra Parvi. You can ask your question, Parvi. Thank you, Anuman. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, it's an honor to have you today. Uh, so we learned that how having a dialogue and being critical about things is important in an education space. But then I also think about how being a part of the dialogue also comes with a privilege. For example, in the Indian context, uh, a Dalit child or a tribal child or a Muslim child might not even have that space for him or her to be able to contribute to that dialogue. So how do we as educators create a more inclusive uh, and a safe space for children from marginalized communities? Yeah. Now, very good question. And your question would take all of us to the domain of reflexivity. You know, that um, how, for example, uh, we, if we are really sincere in the spirit of dialogue and listening, and how important it is constantly to interrogate our locations of privilege and power, and also to decondition ourselves and to expand our horizon with a heightened empathy and reflexivity and the ability to listen. One day it would not happen, but if with honesty, reflexivity, you know, sincerity, we keep walking, we keep trying, we keep wandering, traveling, then we might move towards that. You know, it's like saying that whenever I read Om Prakash Balmiki's Juthan, and when Om Prakash Balmiki spoke of his own experience as a student, you know, how the school headmaster humiliated him, oppressed him, abused him, simply because of his caste origin. Now, I have not experienced it. I have not seen it. I went to a school where my two elder brothers already studied. So every teacher knew me. I was pampered, I was loved. So I didn't know what it meant to be Om Prakash Balmiki in a school. But when I read it, then what happened through my body, I could not experience it. Maybe the first is about certain kind of intellectual cognition. That intellectually I begin to cognize, oh, this is the caste-ridden Indian society, you know? And, and as Om Prakash R. Dalmiki said, despite Ambedkar, Gandhi and freedom struggle, the caste operates so strongly and he experienced it. First, intellectually I begin to make sense of it. And maybe that intellectual cognition would be the first step that would lead me now, inspire me to converse with more and more Om Prakash Balmikis. And possibly there are Om Prakash Balmikis in my own class who were also silent. And now do I see them? Do I observe them? Do I take one step further, you know, uh, so that they overcome what Freer would argue 
that oppressive silence and regain their voice, you know, articulate their language. So I think our reflexivity, our questioning of our own privileged location and our quest and search, that has to go on constantly. I do not know whether there is any instant, immediate formula to that, but only answer is that you and I have to acknowledge it and try our best to walk through it. Yeah, I can see the hands of Rajan, uh, uh, but uh, before that, there was a question in the chat box from Sonu Papachan. Uh, the question is, in Indian campuses, we can't easily find a teacher that you explained as a co-traveler, comrade to walk along with the process of learning. Another thing is that we can hardly find a professor who questioned the existing majoritarian political system in the Indian academia. Even if someone dared to question it, she or he may not get enough support even from their co-workers. So my question is, do we lose the sharpness of critical, critically engagement in our academic spaces? It's a difficult question. And I believe that uh, each of us, as a student and teacher individually and collectively, uh, morally and politically, um, we have to um, um, look at it, find our ways. Now, I think that uh, uh, you know that one of the important question um, uh, uh, and a very difficult question that I've often asked myself and I believe all teachers would ask themselves. Um, and that question is who'd educate the educators, you know? Uh, uh, um, you know, the way a sensitive child would ask, who'd educate the parents, you know? Uh, 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 and um, so um, it's like, you know, a question we all ought to ask. And, uh, and your question takes us to that, you know? And, uh, and this is where, as the earlier question I said, that uh, if our campuses it doesn't exist, it's a sad commentary, you know, political part, I'm not coming right now, but um, if the teacher is not dialogic, if the teacher um, exercise his or her arbitrary power over students and silences students through her scholarship, through her knowledge, uh, through her position, and if that is the dominant reality, as your question suggests, then it is indeed very sad. Uh, it is indeed very unfortunate. And then the question really emerges, how do we educate ourselves as teachers? And I believe that uh, 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 the, uh, uh, you know, that what uh, uh, Rumi uh, um, um, uh, was fond of saying uh, through his messages, through his poetry and revelations, uh, the ultimate power uh, it's not the power of surveillance, not the power of control, not the power of killing others, but the ultimate power is the power of love and the power of communication. And if a teacher engages and if a teacher celebrates that power, that power of communication and the power of love, you know, and um, uh, then uh, uh, many of these issues would be resolved you know, many of these issues would be resolved. It is unfortunate uh, that we celebrate another kind of power, the power to silence others, the power to dominate over others, the power to control, you know. So it is something that, you know, we all ought to ask ourselves. Then possibly one day, if we really go for that, one day you might find teachers in your colleges and universities who are more dialogic, who are more open-ended, who are like co-travelers. And, uh, and I believe that the, uh, uh, even if a teacher uh, is not overtly political in the sense that doesn't belong to a political party or doesn't come to a political protest or demonstration, but it is possible for a teacher and one should to become sensitive to the discourse of power. 
Now, and this is what I am saying, then you need not be uh, uh, very overtly politically active as a teacher. But suppose um, um, uh, you are uh, yeah, you are teaching, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 the uh, sociology of totalitarianism or the fascism in the classroom, or you are uh, introducing students uh, uh, to books like this, you know, uh, Eric Fromm's The Escape from Freedom or Wilhelm Reich's The Mass Psychology of Fascism. Now, is it possible for a teacher, a really sensitive teacher, to refer to this book in the classroom without ever looking at his or her own world, own society, right now, here and there? You know, can you theorize authoritarianism without ever talking about the authoritarianism that you see right now, here and now. And I think this kind of sensitivity is absolutely important on the part of the teacher. And it is this sensitivity, without that sensitivity, without that reflection, we cannot bring our classroom closer to the experience. And we cannot bring the spirit of enchanting, liberating, critical pedagogy in our classroom. And that's why people like you should keep raising this question. It should make us alert, you know. Yeah, now uh, that uh, I can see the uh, hands of Rajan. Uh, Rajan, you can ask your question. So uh, as, we have, uh, as we are talking about teachers, the teacher should be compassionate, teacher should be uh, sensitive and everything. A teacher should have all the good qualities of the human. But the issue that comes is say, how, how to get such teacher, teacher. And second thing, the number of such teachers. You know, we are talking about such teachers. The teacher should be like this or that for so many years. You know, but, but we haven't provided any, any mechanism to how such teachers in such a required quantity would be created. You know? So the, the issue you were talking about, the, this entrance test together. They actually are fitted with the Tina factor, right? as used by the Thatcher. Okay, as we do not have any other option, so let's go for this. Right? So, so would you please comment on it? Uh, Rajan, this is a brilliant inquiry and this is my question also. And thank you for raising it. And you were absolutely right. There are also, we need certain kind of conditions also to make our classrooms dialogic, you know, and teacher, student know one another, talk to one another, there is compassionate listening and critical pedagogy. One of the important thing is that, uh, that uh, 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 teacher student ratio, that I think is a very, very important factor. You know, that it is, I remember, I'll just give you an illustration. When I joined the university as a faculty, in the MA classroom, there were 25 to 30 students. You know, uh, and I would remember those early days, 25 to 30 students, you know, when the students would write their assignments, uh, each student, I would know everyone by name. And I could, and for each student assignment, I could write one page small note that what I felt about the assignment and give it to the students. Now it was possible that beautiful communication was made possible because it was a very manageable classroom. A teacher engaging with 20, 25 students, then in the open space of the university, meeting them in the university canteen, in the library, in the campus life, they come to your house, you meet them. So it was possible. But when today, when I retired, in a compulsory course, I would face 120 students. Now, and also with the process of aging, it would be increasingly, it would be difficult for me to know the names of all. And as a result, I could realize the dialogue, the intensity, the listening, which was there in those times, that is somewhat declining. It is declining because now the teacher-student ratio is not very conducive to it. So we actually, these are the infrastructural issues. 
recruitment of more and more teachers you know recruitment of giving more and more creating more and more spaces to the teacher so that at the end of the day teacher is not an overburdened teacher but when the teacher comes to the classroom the teacher comes to the classroom with some freshness with some life energy you know not a overburdened classroom six lectures in a day and constantly right evaluating this assignment or other so i entirely agree with you we have to work on all these things uh, to make it possible i spoke of the ethos the philosophy but i think that to implement it much more meaningfully the questions you raised acquire uh, uh, become absolutely important but having said that i would say another thing even when these objective conditions are present it is possible to see non dialogic teachers you know even when a teacher in a semester is teaching one course and engaging with 20 student it is possible to see an authoritarian teacher all objective conditions are present and another teacher somewhat more burden more difficult circumstances is possibly more dialogic and that is what i would argue that it's a constant interplay of your creative agency and the structural issues we need the structural infrastructure and we also need our creative will creative agency the other day a school teacher from a factory school in delhi asked me sir ठीक है डिस्कनेक्ट कर इंटरनेट नहीं in the process of a conversation we just talked i said and he said that there is so much of constraint it's a typical factory school there is a parental pressure that they need all the time toppers all students have to get 100 out of 100 cbse toppers and all that so i suggested him that 50 minutes classroom i can think that 45 minutes you follow what your school principal is asking you to do and your parents are pressurizing but 5 minutes give 5 minutes to you and if you have the will in that 5 minutes you can do some wonder so he said that how come so i gave him an illustration i said take an ncert textbook maths book take the chapter on percentage profit loss most of the sums that you would see is essentially from the mercantile world a shopkeeper bought a television set in 6000 rupees after 3 months sold it in 7500 rupees what is the percent of profit the listed price of a t-shirt is 600 rupees after giving 10% discount he still has 5% profit what is the actual price now most of the sums of this kind of the mercantile world of profit and loss i said one day you give a different sum in those 5 minutes in the classroom that a bottle of pepsi cost 40 rupees and the same amount of lemon water cost 10 rupees by what percent pepsi cost more than the lemon water you just keep this pose this problem and ask student to solve this problem mathematically it's a very easy answer the child could do it but possibly out of those 50 children two or three children would come home ask their parents that why is it that pepsi cost more than drinking water more than lemon water why lemon water is not such a bad drink and pepsi is not such a healthy drink so why still that the pepsi cost more than lemon water who knows out of 52 children might ask this parents and parents need not be prabhat patnaik's political economist of neoliberal capitalism but that would lead parents to think about it 
And then with the same mathematical skill of profit and loss, you are engaging the critical faculty of young students. It question is in his mind now that why is it Pepsi cost more than lemon water? This is the possibility, even amid the constraints. And I believe that that's why your question would answer, we need both. We need to fight for the infrastructure, but we also need the creative will. We also need our agency. Otherwise, with the best infrastructure, you might find very bad teachers. You know, that is what uh, I would suggest. Thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, I can see uh, Rekha's uh, hands up. Uh, Rekha is uh, our chairperson at this Hyderabad. She joined the meeting late. Uh, Rekha? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Anu, uh, Ramya's question was posed before mine. So maybe uh, she could go ahead and I'll come back. It's okay. Uh, uh, I will ask Ramya's question oh, after yours. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Patrick, for. The, for choosing the subject and addressing it in such a deep and rich manner. I want to introduce uh, my own dilemma, but it's I'm coming fresh from uh, talking about Stenhouse's uh, humanities uh, uh, curriculum project. So where he brings in this position that, I mean, he's moving towards establishing dialogic classes as well, but his position is that the teacher's position should be, I mean, the teacher in uh, the classroom should adopt an entirely neutral position. Uh, and I think, which is what maybe we do in what you're suggesting in terms of listening is also uh, assuming a certain kind of neutrality. But I'm wondering too, that most of us have our own point of view and we uh, tend to uh, try and get the students to see that point of view. And his position is strongly argues against that and says uh, that the teaching is not about uh, transforming students, but getting them to learn, getting them to think, uh, getting them to understand the nature and scope of the implications of their uh, point of view and take responsibility for it. So I was just thinking that there are these, uh, so there is this dilemma about the teacher's position, especially in relation to like, uh, he's speaking particularly about controversial topics. And as we all know, every topic in the present time is quote unquote controversial. So, uh, but it's not for that reason, but in terms of dial uh, uh, extending the dialogue in the classroom and listening, I think it, it comes mainly from the authority that a, a teacher figure has, irrespective of the intention of the teacher that they do, that their position uh, is something that students would, uh, probably carry or the teacher expects them to carry. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. No, no, um, no lovely. It's a very important, deep question. You know that I would, uh, you know, what I could answer to it, there could be many answers to this question. You know, I would try to answer to that and what mm, I have tried and I try my best to do that. Um, with at times uh, success, at times with failure, but it's a it's a fault, it's a uh, search, and that is something you know uh, uh, of which I would say that uh, I spoke of Jitu Krishnamurti at one place, and I believe that one of the fantastic lecture he delivered when he came out of um, Ani Basant and her wish to transform him into a world messiah and all that, and he came out. And he's realized that no organized sect, no organized religion, no fixed dogma uh, can take us closer to the truth. And truth is a pathless land. And that is where his notion of the spirit of being a wanderer, it's a pathless land. Now, I think that is something uh, which I see is um, um, remarkably insightful uh, for teachers uh, who uh, seek to bring a lot of dialogue in the classroom and sensitivity in the classroom. I often tell students, I just gave an illustration of uh, modern Indian social thought. When you bring people like uh, uh, Phule and Vivekananda, Ambedkar and Aurobindo, Gandhi and Tagore, or Rajni Pamdaup or Raymond Roy, all in the classroom, Marxist, Ambedkarite, Gandhian, spiritualist, 
and you could imagine that the students depending on their social and political locations uh, become extremely hyped. You know, someone would not like to hear the name of Gandhi. Someone would not like to hear the name of any Marxist, you know. So a lot of tension and the quarrel would take place and the listening would often collapse. And then as a teacher, uh, two things I try to do. One, um, I try to do that, you know, and sometimes some student would say that, sir, when um, uh, you were talking about Tagore, it seems that you are a Tagorean. And when you talk about Ambedkar, it seems that you are an Ambedkarite. So I tell that, no, it's not about being an Ambedkarite and Tagorean. My first task is to try my best to present Ambedkar through his own writings and through illustration and to make it and to present it before you. And then you listen to it, read books, engage with that. And then my task is to present whoever I'm doing it. So I think this is a very important thing that if I'm a Marxist professor and I'm teaching Gandhi, my task to begin with is to present Gandhi in front of the student through his books, through his practice, through his politics in front of the classroom. And then let student engage, interrogate them and take part with them in their question. That is one. And second, the Krishnamurti thing about the pathless land. I often feel and I try to tell students that see that you may be an Ambedkarite, you may be a Gandhian, you may be a Marxist, but now think of this and let us experiment. And then it's a metaphor. You see that imagine you are walking through a forest and each tree, ancient big tree is so beautiful and each tree has its own shade and history. And you do not want to confine yourself to one tree. So you sit under a tree. It is Bihar Ambedkar. Feel it, experience it. Then another tree is calling you. Just walk. It is Rabindranath Tagore. Just sit under the tree. You know, feel the tree for some time. Don't arrive. Don't conclude. Don't think that you have traveled the forest. So many trees are calling you and move around, be a wanderer, you know? And, and this is the time to be a wanderer. This is not the time to be so certain of everything. Just open. There is so many things to explore, you know? Now, uh, I tend to feel that, you know, possibly every day, every moment, in our own ways, uh, we have to keep that innocence, we have that keep the spirit of wonder alive. The burden of certainty, the burden of reductionism uh, often blocks our thinking, you know. So it's a complex process, ceaseless process of trial and error, success and failure, you know. So, but thank you for raising, it's a shared concern. Yeah, I was saying the analogy was lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, uh, now there is a question in the chat box by Ramya. Uh, her question is, in the neoliberal world, the purpose of education is increasingly being seen as employability or the gaining of skills. How do we stop this and bring in ideas of empathy, compassion, and critical pedagogy into mainstream education? Yeah. You know, I think this is a, something I also hinted at. And um, in our time, as I said that, um, Henry Gill, that you know, um, American professor written extensively on the neoliberal uh, attack on the domain of education and learning, raises this point, the point you raised uh, very powerful, that when uh, the market colonizes the domain of education and the domain of learning, in a different context, the new left thinker Habermas made it a very beautiful point that communicative rationality breaks down. And as the colonization of life world takes place, the instrumental logic of the system invades every sphere of life. You know? And now this invading market is invading the family relationships. Market is invading the realm of education. 
and that is where the new liberalism the commodification of education marketization of education and as you have rightly said transforming education into a mere skill into a mere techno managerial skill and transforming students into workforce into resources for the corporate workforce that becomes the primary agenda of the education and that's the major road down that's what they huh that's what they think about it at 3 minutes ago yeah sorry uh, you can uh -huh. as jerod argue that is why because of this in attack on education the critical liberating function of education empathy democratization listening criticality the deeper functions of education are eroding and its manifestation you could see everywhere the growing devaluation of liberal arts and humanities growing devaluation of you know um uh, critical pedagogy from our uh, academic enterprises and reducing learning into a mere skill learning now this is a major issue and the major problem we are confronting today and this is a struggle as people like jiro would argue at different level at one level it's a larger political struggle against for example this kind of neoliberal invasion in the every sphere of life another is a great educational cultural pedagogic struggle where students teachers who think differently constantly through different kind of movement raise their voice articulate their concerns you know create different kind of alternative sites of resistance and the protest and to create a new kind of awareness about liberating education so it's a long struggle and the multifaceted struggle in the domain of meeting when i was there domain of economic kumbal gallu tumhara haath mood okay mai the fine Shefali, can you please mute? Yeah, sorry. So it's a long struggle in the different domains, but I am very happy that this question is confronting you. This question is disturbing you. Yeah, uh, there is a uh, comment from uh, Disha in the chat box. Uh, Disha, are you there? Do you want to uh, uh, share it with Professor Fadil? Yeah, I mean, you could read. So, so basically, yeah, so the need to be politically correct all the time, I think, in academic spaces, is also a burden of sorts. The pedagogy of hope is often seen as a sign of weakness. And each time you say something, which may be against the tide, or even try to be reasonable, then you are kind of that fear of being accused to be like you know i think there's a lot of pressure on the academics to be politically correct so people don't speak up easily yeah no disha you were absolutely right and that is something that all of us have to fight you know um, that um, um, and uh, and the uh, and the epistemology of hope pedagogy of hope and uh, and, and, and 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 striving for the art of possibility you know if um, uh, and meaningful education would inspire us to strive for the art of possibility uh, um, uh, and um, if political correctness degenerates into burden of certainty and cynicism you know it becomes very oppressive it is very important you know uh, for all of us you know uh, to keep that spirit of the hope pedagogy of hope epistemology of hope and what i would say the art of possibility art of possibility alive because without that possibility without um, that striving no dialogue is possible no communication is possible and um, uh, and um, uh, uh, this is uh, you know uh, i believe that i personally learned a lot of these things from a um, lot of from the pacifist movement all over the world you know and uh, the way they would uh, talk about just <clears throat> just a minute
Yeah, so the way uh, 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 they would talk about and strive for, you know, nonviolent mode of conflict resolution, um, uh, compassionate listening, conversations, and the dialogues. And uh, we, uh, um, and in such a terribly violent world with such extreme orthodoxies from all sides, uh, educators and the teachers, we, I believe that uh, we have a role to play uh, to reassert its important time and again. Thank you. Yeah. Now I can see Alago's hands up. You have a question, Alago? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, so basically, we've all been conditioned to the system where examinations are seen as performative standards and like most of us have come through the system. So uh, in a classroom where we are focusing on dialogue, a compassionate listening, uh, critical pedagogy, like so, what do you think can be a form of, I mean, like, I mean, like not necessarily meaning at an assignment submission or exam, but what can be a mechanism of feedback in a classroom where we are practicing listening, uh, healthy dialogues and everything. So what do you see as a form of feedback for teachers and for students? Or I believe, you know, uh, 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 through my limited experiences, I can uh, throw some light on that. Now, uh, if, um, uh, if it, um, uh, a teacher has got a reasonable amount of autonomy, autonomy in terms of uh, deciding the mode of teaching, autonomy in terms of also deciding the reading list, experimenting with assignments. Most of the universities, it doesn't have, but for quite some time, uh, not now, but for quite some time, as my personal experience suggests, I was lucky that in my university, that possibility was there to a great extent. Uh, none would essentially interfere in the way you would engage with students, the kind of questions you would raise and the way you would teach and things of that kind. So it was in that sense, I was fortunate, I was lucky. But I know that possibly that situation doesn't exist everywhere, most of the places it doesn't exist. If it exists and for that, I think it is also important for teachers, you know, to fight for that, you know, to strive for that. And increasingly, we are losing that space everywhere. More and more surveillance, more and more domination is coming in all campuses, you know. And it is that we have to strive for. Um, you know, but, but if you get that space, then I think that a dialogue, listening, and the critical pedagogy would lead to a very beautiful system of feedback and also a different kind of assignments. You know, uh, uh, and uh, I'll just give you one illustration. And um, uh, uh, once in a course, um, uh, um, I asked, I uh, encouraged a group of MS students uh, uh, to write uh, um, um, uh, a small um, uh, note about 1500 word note on Gandhi's experiments, on Gandhi in a modern Indian social thought, Gandhi's experiment is true. And then um, I asked them that Gandhi did talk about a lot of walking. Gandhi's entire life was about walking, you know. And his last dream was also to walk towards Pakistan before he was assassinated. So uh, at the walking, and also Gandhi wrote extensively on body and diet and food. So I said that don't just read Viku Parekh and Ashish Nandi, you know, that is very easy to do it. Read that, but also do the thing that one day all of you go for fasting. Ah, realize that what fasting is, does something happen? 
what your body experiences at the time of fasting, you know. Uh, 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 then go for a walk, long, long walk, you know. Feel the walk, you know. Walking, fasting, experience. Now let us try to experience Gandhi through body also. Uh, through body also, not just through Ashish Nandi and Kothari, you know, through body also, and then collectively, then, then just to write about your experiment with fasting, Gandhi's experiment with fasting, uh, Gandhi's experiment with truth, and write about it. Now, I think that the st students enjoy that. Students feel extremely excited about it. They begin to say that, now I'm, we are writing an assignment which is not typical bookish assignment. And this is the assignment which cannot be plagiarized. You know, what can be plagiarized if you ask a student to write that did the salient features of Max Weber's Protestant ethic and the split of capitalism. You know, question is plagiarized, answer will be plagiarized. You know, so as teachers, we have to learn to raise non-plagiarized question. It is easy to blame students that students write plagiarized answer, but our thinking is plagiarized as teachers. The assignments we give are plagiarized, you know, and critical pedagogy is not just about students. It is about constant learning and unlearning on the part of teachers. Our question is plagiarized. Yes. Uh, yes, I mean, thank you, sir. Thank you for the question. For me, always there's been this question with exams. I mean, like, I always keep thinking, okay, this is not the right thing to do, but what can replace this so that I can make an argument telling, okay, like, let's not do this. So, always been stuck with that question. And, yes. Yeah. And keep <laughs> asking this question, thinking about it, go out of box, ask impossible questions, you know, love the impossible. Yes. Uh, now there is a question from Kajal in the chat box. Uh, Kajal, are you there? Do you want to ask the question? Uh, so maybe I will ask. So but her question is numerous research confirms that for meaningful learning, it is necessary to contextualize education. My question is while contextualizing education, how much it is necessary to be aware of issues and challenges that hinders education of some learners? You know, let me um, 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 uh, respond to it very quickly. You know, that our classroom is not a different planet. Uh, it is not in the Mars, or it is here. It is here. If there is a storm outside, if there is earthquake outside, if there is political turmoil outside, you know, in classroom, we cannot pretend that it is free from that. It is outside that. And as students and teachers, we have not come from another planet. We live here. We live here. We come to our classroom with our social, political, historical, cultural experiences. You know, so all these are in the classroom. And that's why the context always comes. History always comes, context always comes. But the meaningful pedagogy, meaningful critical pedagogy, what it does is that it seeks to create a mode of thinking, a mode of analysis and awareness that enables the learner, teacher and the student together to make sense of that context, to understand that context much more meaningfully and to move towards a better world, towards a more meaningful world. So it is like saying that, for instance, that uh, when we teach theory, I'll take an illustration. When we teach theory in the classroom, and most of the time, many students often complain. If in the early childhood, students complain about maths phobia, they say that we don't like maths because maths is too much about abstraction, you know, uh, uh, about calculus, about negative integers, about numbers, about differential equations, and we cannot relate to maths, you know. 
and they say that maths is too abstract. We cannot experience mathematics the way we can experience poetry. So there's a lot of maths phobia we see among children. Likewise, when they come to the colleges and the universities and do social sciences, and have seen that the students say that we can't relate to theory. Theory looks very abstract. You know, we can't relate to substantial courses when we are studying about caste or patriarchy or gender, about social movement, we relate to that, but it is very difficult to understand theory courses. One of the important reasons why it happens is a massive pedagogic failure in your classroom. We seek to teach theory as teacher, completely decontextualizing it. And that's the first error we make. And we tend to give the impression to the student that theory is essentially intellectual gymnastic. Theory is essentially repetition of big names and the big jargon. Michel Foucault to Judith Bittler to Talcott Parsons to Pierre Bourdieu to Louis Althusser to Antonio Gramsci and to all sorts of terminologies associated with semiotics, post-structuralism, post-modernism and dialectics. You know? So that's the impression the student gets. But I think a minimum, meaningful pedagogy would bring the theory, you know, in the context and relate the theory to history, to the context, to the time. And then the theory would acquire its soul and meaning. Theory would acquire its soul and meaning. Now, I'll just give one illustration and that would make it meaningful. So I do not know how many of you have done sociology, classical sociology, but if some of you have done it, now when you study, you know, sociology students, their Bible is Durkheim, Weber, Marx, you know. So Durkheim wrote about in the elementary forms of religious life, say, you know, that ancient religious practice said totemism. Now for him, totem is an emblem. Totem is a symbol. Totem is sacred. So if my clan, the totem is kangaroo, it is sacred, you know, and my everywhere, my kitchen walls, my everywhere kangaroo is ingrained, you know, it is sacred, it is believed that it is endowed with a great power. So among, you know, a non-modern tribal clan community, Durkheim was seeing it and talking about totemism. So I ask modern students and say that when you read Durkheim this, then how do you look at it? Now, do you think that something that Durkheim saw that even today exists even now in the 21st century with you, the modern metropolitan English speaking urban students who believe that we are all individuals discrete individuals would, because we have separate other card and bank card and identity card, you know, with a separate name and identity and all that. But then I gave illustration, if Durkheim gave an illustration of totemic dance. Now think of another totemic dance in the 21st century. One day cricket match in the Bombay Stadium, India is playing against Pakistan. And Birat Kohli has made six, and suddenly 50, 100 people in the stadium, and many of youngsters like my student came to the stadium with the national flag, the color ingrained here, like the totem ingrained here. And the moment Birat Kohli, six, and 50,000 people begin to dance, and the national flag is everywhere. Now, what is that we are seeing? What is that we are seeing? Is it that totting in our time has been replaced by the flag? Is it the clan solidarity at an intense moment has been replaced by nationalist euphoria? Or is it that, that the village site where the dance took place has been replaced by a modern cricket stadium? Now, a 21st century student begins to engage with Durkheim now. You know, 
much more meaningfully deeply and that is what i believe the task you know relating theory to experience you know and contextualizing it not reducing it into mere intellectual gymnastic and that's why the history the experience the context the memory and i always believe in your classroom children should be able to smell both you know the smell of a mall that is the smell of the urban affluent class and that smell is a combination of french perfume and starbucks coffee they should also be able to smell the smell of the fish market the smell of the lower middle class you know they should also be able to smell you know the drain overflowing the smell of the slum you know make classroom that children smell that and that's a great pedagogic challenge pedagogic task and this i believe teacher and student have to try have to work together for that yeah i guess uh, it is almost uh, uh, nearing 6 o'clock uh, yes. so we may have to conclude uh, thank you very much uh, professor avijit padak for that inspiring uh, talk that opened up a myriad of possibilities for all of us and it is kind of a pedagogy of hope compassion and love that you shared with all of us now uh, i will hand over to um, alagu alagu uh, are you there yes ma'am yeah uh, so first of all thank you for accepting our invite and being here and sharing all your insights perspectives your experiences from classrooms and and your ideas with us i think it was some insights that you gave were really like new for us and it was really i mean like uh, eye opening to listen to especially the math class analogy that you shared and an analogy that you shared and also your thoughts on exams and how you know assignments could be a little different where you make the students feel like and engage them better and i think all these perspectives were really new and actually uh, so just sharing something very personal so when i joined uh, psychology in my ug degree our professors like told us that you know like uh, the most important quality for a psychologist like either you be a counselor or a clinical psychologist is to be empathetic and that was the first time i heard the word empathetic and i thought it was a quality that was just restricted only to psychologists who are going to be dealing with more people but then after coming here and uh, reading about other educationists and their thoughts and everything i realized empathy is something that everyone is supposed to have and i mean like a better way to do it is through education where you know we practice listening uh, critical questioning dialogues and and the ideas that you shared with us today so uh, it has been a i think everyone would agree that it is a very insightful se uh, session so thank you for today sir so thank you thank you thank you very much thank you for this opportunity i really enjoyed it and best wishes everybody take care stay safe okay disha thank you sir ah uh, ono the challenge is the challenge now is so how to create many more pathas many more avijit pathas that's uh, the challenge uh, <laughs> and uh, thank you ono thank you uh, and stay safe okay disha we'll meet take care okay, thank you sir thank you all the best thank you Ma'am, you're on mute. You, you're mute. Uh, Anu, ma'am, you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah, nice to see you, uh, Disha, and thank you for joining till mm -hmm. here today. He's my like. You have to know him to understand his work. Also, I think sometimes people think it's too simplistic or naive, but it is not. You need to know him as a person and what he's talking about to be able to make sense of his ideas. So in that sense, it's quite phenomenal. Yeah, I think uh, uh, also he write. I really like one of his article on um, he went to a school and worked, and then he wrote about that experience. That uh, that was also a uh, that was also titled pedagogy of love. Uh, so 
Uh, yeah, I, I actually I introduced uh, uh, some of uh, his writings to uh, the MA second year students. They enjoyed reading him. And that's why we thought we will invite him. No, oh, good, great. Like for other work, we say you have to understand the social context to be able to comment on children or teachers or school or whatever. I think personally, I feel you have to know him as a person to understand what he's trying to say. And he's, he's very bold also, so like, you know, in terms of taking positions, not being, not camping with, not taking sides, or trying to be politically correct. So, I mean, for the sake of it, for the sake of it, that's what I mean. He's quite phenomenal. Yeah. And he walks a lot, by the way. He just walks. He has no vehicle, he walks. Okay. He walks and he spends, I think, he used to that time, at least two hours in the sun. He used to go to his floor, I mean, the rooftop, and he's this. Yeah, be with the sun, so. Yeah, he's a great, good, good you call him. So it can be seen in his writings also, uh, like uh, very aesthetically beautiful writing, very spiritual. And, and he's also a simple person, now because academic centric and so very seriously. You think we are doing a great job and people should like, you know, but the moment you don't take yourself seriously in that sense, that, you know, that pride or like this and the other, I think that makes you, the idea is also to be a better person, better human being. I, I, at least that's what I feel that's important as well. So it was a nice gathering and uh, yeah. being together. You've been doing a good job. So see you at the next talk, Kadish. I will send you the talk announcement. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, Alago. Thank you, Ruth, all students.